Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Man, not only can she sing, she's good looking. Amen? Now, if you're new to Summit, this is your first Sunday. That's my wife. Uh, just in case, if you're watching on Facebook, which we're glad you are. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of partial to her. So, uh, hey, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at this passage in Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, your apps, you can turn over there. But I kind of want to uh, do a quick review this morning as we um, continue in this therefore chapter. If you remember, I, I told you chapters 1 through 11 is theology, where Paul is laying out what Christ has done for us. And then he comes to chapter 12, and he says, therefore, and I, I told you a couple of weeks ago, uh, anytime you find the word therefore in scripture, you have to ask what the word therefore is there for. So therefore, <laughs> we're now transitioning from uh, theology to behavior, theology to ethics. And so Paul is now saying, in view of God's mercies, this is how you should live. This is how it should look. So let's go back and let's read and, and let's just start from the beginning in Romans chapter 12. Okay. Verse one, it says, therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercies to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Let me talk right here. Worship is not just singing. Let me say that again. Worship is not just singing. We've come to a point in our culture and church and over the last few years that many people think, oh, now it's time to worship. That means now we're gonna sing. No, so here's what Paul says. Everything in view of God's mercies, you should offer your body. That's everything, outside and inside. That's not just on Sunday morning. That's last night too. <gasps> I know, might've been a rough night last night. But here's what Paul's saying. This is true and proper worship when we realize it's not just something we do on Sunday, it's something we are, that it transforms everything. In fact, look at the next verse in chapter two, verse two. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing will. That word transformed is where we get our word from the Greek metamorphosis. And, and, and here's what that means. Metamorphosis literally means a change of form or, or nature of a thing or a person into a completely different one by natural or supernatural means. So think caterpillar to butterfly. Think tadpole to frog. Here's what Paul's saying, transform your mind. Because see, here's what we know. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. And your character will determine your destiny. So here's what Paul was saying, transform your mind. And the reality and what we know is that's a supernatural thing that he does in us, but we have a responsibility to create a, a, this new in our mind that we're thinking on the things of God. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, therefore in everything that he's done, transform your mind. Now let's go on in verse three. For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God's distributed to each of you. Verse four, for just as each of us has one body with many members, all these members do not have all the same function. So in Christ, we, though we're many, 
form one body and each member belongs to all the others. You remember we said a couple of weeks ago that the church is made up by individuals that represents the whole, just as your body has arms and legs and lungs and liver and all the parts of your body, they work together for one, just like us in the body of Christ. For those of us that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we all make up the greater whole. But if you remember I said a couple of weeks ago, what happens for many of us is we have margin and that margin is what I'm calling sin. I like saying margin because it, it kind of disarms some of you. But at the last, at the, at the bottom line, it's sin in our life. And all of us have those areas that we're working on. And we think, hey, it doesn't affect anybody else. And it doesn't affect the church. It doesn't affect, but here's what happens. You take all of our margin and you add it up to the whole. All of a sudden, we got a lot of margin in the church. And that's why Paul was saying, look, man, you, we all belong to each other. And you may think nobody's going to matter. Hey, you know, it's just me. And hey, nobody else is at home when I'm looking at that. And nobody knows where I spend my money. And nobody knows where my eyes go. But listen, God does. And here's what he's saying. We're all a part of the body. And, and when people look at the church and their frustration with the church, really what they're looking at is the margin in our own personal lives. Because there's really no difference between us and them many times. And they're going, hey, man, I got enough chaos in my life. I don't need any more in the church. And the reason many people won't come to church is because they're looking at our life and they're not seeing any difference because they're looking at that margin. And so that's why Paul said, look, man, you need to transform your minds. And your act of worship is the body, both inside and outside, what we're going to be looking at in just a minute. So we have this margin. Now look at verse 9. We, stopped, we kind of taught on this a couple weeks ago. He says, love must be sincere. In other words, without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. You know, hate what is evil. Think about that. Verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And today I'm going to be looking at a, a, a verse that, because last week we talked about this anger thing, and we talked about how we treat each other and what makes us angry and just what lies just underneath where we get our anger. And we're going to kind of explain that a little bit this morning is that we don't get what we want. And when we don't get what we want, then we get anger or we don't get what we deserve. We get anger. And that's why Paul said, love must be sincere without hypocrisy, without an agenda, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. And then today, what I want to talk about may sound impossible. In fact, today what we're going to talk about, if you don't keep in mind verses 1 and 2 of what we just read, therefore, based on what God's already done, what we're about to read may, at first, last week when I mentioned it, I saw some people going, uh-uh, that ain't going to happen. It almost sounds impossible if we forget what Christ has done, because what we're about to talk about can only be done in the power of Christ can only be done when we understand our identity. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Huh? See, it sounds impossible almost, doesn't it? Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. And don't be conceited. Verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. You're like, really, Paul? But then it gets even worse. Look at verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, that's where I want to camp today. And, and before you check out on me, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer to that question. Because I know what you're thinking right now. What if you can't? You see, in spite of all of what we've read in Romans, in spite of all that God has done and all that Jesus has done, can I just go ahead and let you hear this? It still may not be possible to live at peace with everyone. But when it is, when it's not possible, you need to make sure that you're not the reason why. Right, let me say that again. I stumbled over that. Sadly, in spite of all that Christ has done, it is still not possible to live peaceably with all men. And when it's not possible, you need to make sure that you're not the reason why. Okay? Sometimes we have to fight a war for peace. Amen? Sometimes there's those things. 
And see, some of us need to ask, why are we making war? Because what's happened in the church is there's people who want to make war all the time. Amen? Okay? Let's roll it on. Verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Dang. That's not in there, by the way. I've got to quit doing that. Anyway, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you ever wondered what that means? Heap burning coals on their head? It's a 2,000 year old phrase. And here, here this kind of help you. There's several different explanations for it, but probably the best explanation of it is and back in those days, you had to have fire to cook. Now, now we're spoiled today because some of you have natural gas, some of you have electric, some of you have that glass top, and you, you know, you have, some of you have that Viking stove, and you know, I'm jealous and all that good stuff. And, uh, but back in the day, they had to do fire. And so if you didn't have fire, then you were forced, if you couldn't make fire, you had to go to your neighbor's house and go, hey, dude. No, just got a fire. Can I have some coals? So what they did was they took and they would heap coals into a container. And the more you heap, and depending on how far you went, they would put that lid on that container and they would put it on their head and they would carry it home. And hopefully by the time they got home, if they heaped enough coals, they could pour it in there. Now, can you imagine what it would be like today to heap coals on somebody, right? Because you're like, man, I don't have any, like real coals. I know we're a bunch of rednecks and some of you have coals burning in your yard. I do right now. I burned yesterday. Can I get an amen? amen. Love Jesus. Want to go to heaven? You burn stuff every weekend. <laughs> amen. Can you imagine for someone that you're upset with that they've offended you and you're over here and you're making your fire? and you realize they don't have a fire, that you take some of your fire and you bless your enemy. You're heaping, because see, they don't expect to get something from you. And it's unexpected that you would give something to them. So when Paul says you're heaping coals on them, then you're actually blessing them. Let me put in another illustration. How many of you guys ever had someone while you're at Brookshire's walk in and you're in line to check out and somebody's on their cell phone and they just cut right in front of you? That ever happened to you? Tell you what I do when that happens to me because I'm really spiritual is if somebody's walking in and they cut in front of me and they're on their phone, I'm like, I'll look over another line going, did you see that? I made me look up in the camera going, Maybe to make eye contact with a checker going, are you going to do anything? You know, I'm back here just fuming. How dare that guy? How dare that woman? I can't believe you're cutting in line. Of course, I'm throwing my hands up. Dead gum. Man, can you believe that dude? And then all of a sudden they realize that they've cut in line and they hang up and they go, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I didn't know you were in line. Man, let me get my stuff. And, and they not only get their stuff, they go all the way to the back of the line. And you're like, <laughs> you know what that guy just did to me? He just heaped coals on me. He just heaped coals on me. And now I'm looking in the camera going. <laughs> See, Paul says we heap coals. Romans 12, 17 says, do not repay evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right. And I say, everyone, if it's possible, as it far depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, I'll be right back. I told you I'd be right back. I, I want to draw something for you. I, I, I was doing some study this last week, listening to some guys, and, and some of you are going to really um, love my artwork. And I've got to tell you up front, I'm really nervous about what I'm about to do because I'm not an artist, but I'm going to do my best, okay? You're going to be so stinking impressed. I'm really nervous here. Not bad, huh? I know, I know. Okay, because we don't want him to be a 
kind of a goofy dude. And uh, let's go ahead and give him an ear. Okay. Now, this is where you're going to be impressed. Gosh, I practiced this so much and now I'm scared. <laughs> Hush, don't judge me. Okay, that's your brain. I, I know. I don't need your judgment. Here's what we know. And I, I love this because um, science has finally caught up with Scripture. You ever notice that? Over the years, you know, God wrote so much. And years ago, uh, James, a half-brother of Jesus, made, made this statement in James chapter 1. He said that we should always be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, right? Well, let me tell you that that has a whole lot of science in it. Because there, there's a couple of parts of your brain. This, this part right here is what's called the um, ventral medial prefrontal con, um, uh, cortex. And so this is where, um, I'm just going to label it here. I've got some cheat notes up here because anytime you start talking about um, this stuff, that's supposed to be an F. That's your prefrontal cortex. This is where decisions are made, right? This is, this is where decisions are kind of made out to where, you know, if you're getting into a situation like that guy cut in front of you before you knock his lights out or you ram his buggy, this is the part of your mind that goes, hang on, that may not be the wisest decision, okay? But here's what happens. Anytime you are seeing something coming into the, uh, the uh, eye gate or you getting information coming into the ear. There's this little deal right here, and I'm going to label this, make sure I spell this right, called the thalamus. The thalamus is where all the information comes into your brain, okay? Hang with me for a minute. And then there's this one little area right here, and I like saying this, this is the amygdala. It's fun. Now, let me explain what, what I, why I'm putting this all up here. Because, see, James said everyone should be slow to speak, slow to be angry, and, uh, you know, he was talking about um, quick to listen and all that. Here's what happens. When you have a thought come in your mind, this cat has now stepped in front of me, and immediately I get mad, yeah. right? It takes 12 milliseconds for the thalamus to send a message to the amygdala. The amygdala is a part of your brain that stores memories. It's part of your brain that also causes you to get angry. It's also the part of your brain that causes you, if someone throws something at you, you'll put your arms up. It's also the part of your brain that has to do with sexual arousal. I think that's kind of weird. You know, it has all the anger and then sexual arousal, I don't know. Um, it, it's an interesting part of the brain. And what happens is if something comes into your thalamus and it's beautiful, it's a sunset, then what that thalamus will do, it won't send a message to your amygdala. It's gonna wash your brain with all this chemical that you're gonna go, ah, that's so beautiful. But if it's something that's made you angry, then it's gonna send a message right here. It takes 12 milliseconds. Think about that. That's not very long, okay? 12 milliseconds. Now, if you'll practice what James says, when James says, hey, I, I want you to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for the amygdala to the frontal cortex takes 24 milliseconds. Now, if you'll notice, this part of your brain's higher. Maybe that's where they got the word, take the high road. Because many of us need to give ourselves time for the amygdala to get to the prefrontal cortex. The problem is, what we do is we just camp right here. See, so here's what we know about the brain. I'm fascinated by the brain. Over the last couple of weeks, I got a very good friend of mine that's had a couple of brain surgeries. He's back in the hospital this morning. And I'm just fascinated at what they can do with the brain. There's so much we don't know about the brain. But here's what we do know is that the brain can create neural pathways. And when those neural pathways are created in our brain, that's gonna be where it continually fires. For many of us, we spend more time developing this pathway and we don't have a very well developed pathway to here. So what happens is every time somebody cuts you off in traffic, you wave at them. Don't look at me that way. You know what I'm talking about? Or you'll get right up on their rear end and stare at them through their rear view mirror hoping you can make eye contact. I can see them looking at me, even though they have sunglasses on. You see, the brain is going to develop a neural pathway. And if you're constantly 
quick to get angry, quick to speak, quick to run, quick to go there, quick to respond, then guess what? That's going to become a natural brainwave for you. You see, science finally has figured out some of this, what James told them a long time ago. Listen, we should be quick to listen. In other words, when you got information coming in and information coming to your eye gate, that thalamus is, is, is it's firing, man. And you're thinking, you're dead gum. Don't you cut in front. Did you see that? Get that, that? Come on. Slow down. Give it time to get to your prefrontal cortex. Give it time to get there because in your prefrontal cortex, it's going to say, yes, you could run that guy over, but you'll go to prison. <laughs> chill. Just chill. Yeah, I'd like to knock his lights out. You ever said that? If you do, he might whip you. <laughs> How big old boy are you? You got to give it time. It takes about 20 minutes to get your adrenaline out of your system when, once it's been activated. So you might want to give it more than 24 milliseconds. Somebody get your chair, someone get your seat, someone get your parking place. That did not happen anytime this morning for anybody, right? Hands going up all over the room. See, God's created our brains in these pathways. And if it's possible, Paul said, if it's possible, Relationships are messy, aren't they? I read a quote this last week that Will Rogers, the late actor, author, and humorist, said, I've never met a man I didn't like. Apparently, obviously, he didn't get out much. <laughs> Amen? Because I got some folks I'd introduce him to. And so do you, don't you? I mean, if, when we look at that, if we're honest, we all have people we don't like. And we immediately come to this amygdala, and we immediately have these responses to them. So why is Paul sitting here going, hey man, if it's possible, live at peace with everybody. Listen, if you're going to have healthy relationships and you're going to treat each other as well, everybody listen to me, okay? Everybody listen to me. Then you got to understand it's a you thing. In other words, if you have a whole bunch of hurt relationships in your past, there's a common denominator in there. It's you. I, I, I know. And some of you are mad at me right now. How dare you? I mean, you must be the one person that everyone's out to get. Well, maybe it's because it's you. And maybe you need to look inward. See, relationships, it's a you thing, but it's also a choice thing. That you and I, we're capable of having healthy relationships. But it's your choice. And it's not by your own power. It's by the power of God working in our life. But it's also a difficult thing. You see, love begins when effortlessness ends. When, when all of a sudden it's no longer an effort to love, that's when it begins. Not when the honeymoon's over because you're still trying to figure out that girl, amen? All of a sudden you realize he never picks his underwear up and he never puts the toilet lid down, amen? amen. <laughs> Let's pray and go home. Lord, we, no, I'm just, um. See, here's what we know about relationships and marriage. Just when a marriage is starting to get where there's effort, and then in those beginning years, you're working through that, working through that, and you're getting effort, what happens is we never get to the part where it's good. Because in the beginning, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to love because, oh man, the honeymoon and sex and honeymoon, sex. I know, listen, I, you, come on, you know what I'm saying. You remember that? Some of you, it's been way too long. You need to renew that, okay? Second honeymoon. Gosh, I may get emails. Um, but just about the time, most couples give up. Most couples give up before they get to this place. Relationships are messy. They're worth it. Listen, the Christian life was never meant just to be easy. Do you realize that? Some of you believe this is supposed to be easy. Think about the boxer who beats his body. That's what Paul described the Christian life. He's a boxer that beats his body to get ready or a runner who runs a marathon. Not the kind of runner I am that runs to the end of the driveway and takes a break, amen? I'm talking about a runner who trains to run a marathon. He describes a soldier who trains to fight and he goes to battle. He just doesn't train, he actually goes to battle. He describes an athlete as an Olympic athlete. Listen, the Olympic athletes don't just wake up and 
in high school and go, you know what? I'm gonna be an Olympic athlete. No, they start training at three years old and they spend their entire life. They don't go to public school. They're schooled in Olympic training. That's all their life is. Here's what Paul's saying. The Christian life is about a training process. A farmer who works the ground, not a pot grower who puts a, a, a lot on it. No, we're talking about working the ground, making sure the soil is right, making sure everything's where it's supposed to be. That's the Christian life. And for many of us, our struggle here is we spend too much time just getting angry all the time. Feeling like we gotta respond to everything on Twitter, everything on Facebook. And that path is so well worn. It's been a long time since we've been slow or been quiet. So how do you transform your relational brain? Number one, look at this. You gotta choose blessing. That means forming a new path. When, when Paul was talking about bless those who persecute you, well, I don't want to. Well, do it anyway, because here's what's gonna happen. Bless those who do not curse. Well, I don't want to. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Don't one up them. You ever been around that person? Were you getting along? Oh, man, we bought a house. And the guy's like, great, I have 19. Jerk. <laughs> Why can't he just celebrate? See, in a church, we're always trying to one up people. It's in the world, isn't it? He goes on, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. We can learn so much here of creating new pathways in the brain. And when someone loses somebody or someone's diagnosed with cancer, you know what our most re common response is? Man, I'm so sorry. Do you know my mom had cancer and she died? Thanks for telling me that. I'm encouraged. Mourn with them. Mourn with them. You don't have to give your story or your experience. Just mourn with them. Rejoice with them. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Form a new pathway. I'm gonna give you something in just a minute. You're gonna love it. Don't be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Number two, to create and transform a relational brain, we've got to emphasize, empathize and seek understanding and practice active listening. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who, who mourn. Understand where they're coming from. Understand where they're coming from. Enter into their pain, enter into their rejoicing. You may have bought 15 new trucks, but celebrate with that guy that finally got one. Welcome to auto ownership. Man, I'm so excited. See, to understand, we also have to practice active listening. I told the elders this. I learned this last week. When you find yourself in a situation and your brain is just firing off, and the amygdala is going crazy and the thalamus is going crazy, but you hadn't reached anything up here yet, and you find yourself just interrupting people and always talking, I, we found this this last week, and it's this acrostic I love it. It's called wait. When you find yourself in that situation where you're feeling compelled to interrupt or for compelled to do that, ask yourself this question. Now, let me help you apply this. On Facebook, come on. Ooh, got quiet. Don't you go there, preacher. If you find yourself constantly in the amygdala and feeling like you've got to respond to every political comment, whether you know them or not, wait and ask yourself, why am I talking? Just stop. James, remember, said that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow down. Why am I talking? I'll tell you, change some of you. To seek to understand, to actively listen. Number three, to live in harmony in relationships, you gotta give generous explanations for the gap. Because see, every relationship has gaps, you know that, don't you? 
Romans 12, 17 says, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. Andy Stanley teaches this at his conferences, and he taught us this years ago, because we all have expectations. And so if you can imagine Danielle sitting here, and, and, and I'm sitting here, um, and I'm communicating to Danielle, if she was up here going, honey, I'll be home at, at 5.30 today. And she's like, oh, well, great. Then he'll be here at five and, and he can help me at dinner and he can do with this and he can help me with the kids and he can do the homework. Those are called expectations. And we all have them, don't we? And so when I don't show up until 545, she now has a gap. What's she gonna do with that gap? Well, she can fill it with all kinds of stuff. She can fill it with, he's a jerk. He's a liar. Is he seeing somebody? He's probably dead on the side of the road. See, we do this with our kids. We do this in our marriages. We do this at work. You have a choice of what you're going to put in the gap. Just because they're not sitting by you at the school lunch might mean somebody asked them to go over there and sit with them today. It doesn't mean they're no longer your friend, kids. Come on. What you put in the gap is up to you. What Andy Stanley says, fill the gap with trust. Fill the gap with trust. The problem is many of us have this neural pathway between the thalamus and the amygdala that all we can do is fill the gap with anger. Fill the gap with trust. You have a choice with what you're gonna put into the gap. You can either fill it with grace or you can fill it with judgment. And so many of us in our relationships and our effort to live at peace with everyone, which we're really not making an effort because all we're doing is letting the amygdala run crazy and we're responding to everything. I found that when I'm in a conversation and I'm gonna be in some conversations this week and you're gonna be in some conversations this week at Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up and there's that one uncle, that one aunt, that one cousin that, that just always has the opinion about science and, and atheists and all this stuff and, and you feel compelled because your amygdala wants to fire up and have an argument with them because you feel like you gotta contend for the gospel and you don't really contend for the gospel. All you're doing is contentious. And so what I find that when I want to argue with them or I just wanna be right Right, my response when I hear somebody say that is that's interesting. That's interesting. Wow. Because all of a sudden they can't argue with that's interesting. I'm not agreeing with them. Now, some of you are going to hear me say that to you during this week and you're going to go, is he not wanting to argue with me? Well, that's interesting. See, I, I think that's where it is. Number four, when it comes to rewiring our brains, to avoid a vengeful heart, remember that hurt people hurt people. Romans 12, 17 says, don't repay anyone for evil for evil. Be careful what you do. Be careful that what you do is right in the eyes of everyone. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's interesting. Chuck Swindoll says, evil stirs up more evil. You see, I don't think many of us were born impatient. I think that's just human nature. Because I've traveled in third world countries I've traveled in Middle East, traveled in the Baltic States. And what I find is, is everywhere I go, people are impatient. So it's just kind of a people issue. And so what we're doing by not giving evil for evil, we're refusing to obey our natural instincts. When this amygdala wants to fire off, just let it get to the pre frontal cortex, give you another 24 milliseconds. <laughs> give yourself 20 minutes. If you need to step outside and go for a walk or a smoke or whatever need you need to do, give yourself a moment. Don't immediately go after them. Maybe you use that term. Well, that's interesting. Just walk off. Or that's interesting, turn and talk to Tim. See, I think we're just so quick to return evil for evil. If someone calls the Apostle Paul a homosexual, <gasps> you did what? 
Or if somebody says Jesus might just be a good man and, 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 and Jesus didn't die on the cross. Oh, well, I, I can't let that go. Why can't you? Listen, listen, why am I talking? In the Christian world, we're so busy shouting down non-believers that they can't hear the message of the gospel. So many of us are shouting down people on Facebook that they never can hear the gospel because your amygdala is going crazy. Listen, the reason God put that in there is so that you can, you, you actually can remember that that's going to hurt and you're going to put your arms up. They, they did a study of rats and they could they suck the pins inside the rat's brain and they cut off the amygdala and they found that those rats were not afraid of anything. They'd go after a cat. They'd go after dogs. They'd go after humans. That rat wasn't afraid of anything. I know some of you are probably thinking you've run into some of those test rats. Amen? See, God put that in there for us so that, yes, we would know how to protect. But then he also said, listen, man, through the half-brother of Jesus, man, slow down. Let it get to the prefrontal cortex. This is science here catching up with Scripture. Slow down. Because we all have natural instincts and instinctive responses. But here Paul is calling, calling us to respond supernaturally. And number five, let me throw this up here. You're 100% responsible for and accountable to the stewardship of your relationships. Listen, our vengeance leaves no room for grace. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. See, every one of us have an unavoidable appointment with God. There is a one in one chance that everybody, whether you're a believer or not, are going to die. And on that day, we will stand before the Lord. And when we stand before the Lord, if there's something that needs to be taken care of judgment-wise, he's more than capable of taking care of that. As far as it depends on you, live at peace. Listen, you don't have to always be right. And I'm saying that to me as much as I'm speaking it to you. Because there's something in me, and my wife will say amen to what I'm about to say. I love being right. Leave room. Leave room for God. See, there's a gap in many of our relationships and you feel like it's your responsibility to change him or her or them. Leave room for God. Richard Exley, an old assembly of God pastor, told me one time, he said, God is so much better at conforming men to his image than I am conforming them to mine. Amen? You're responsible and accountable for the stewardship of your relationships. Every one of us, We'll stand before, life, before the Father. And if punishment's due, then he, he can take care of that. In the meantime, what would it look like for you to extend grace? So here's the real question. How do we do it? How do we live peaceably, right? Well, for some, we're not going to be able to. There's just some people out there that all they function out of is the amygdala. And they're always spewing. And for some of us, we may have to distance ourselves. But if you find that you're not at peace with God, can I just say this to you? Then you're going to have a whole lot of issues trying to be at peace with other people. Because right. see, peace with others starts with peace with God. Peace with others starts with peace with God. That peace is found in salvation. It's found in Jesus. There's no other place that peace can be found except through Jesus Christ. Because he is the Prince of Peace. I was reading this last week in Titus where Paul was writing young Titus. And he said this, look at this, this is so good. He said, remember the people, excuse me, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle towards everyone. At one time, you too, 
we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, amen? Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And then Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. (laughs) What would it look like if we did that? If we stress these things, You see, to have healthy relationships and treat others well, I told you this earlier, but look at this. It's a you thing. It really is. If you have a whole bunch of hurt relationships, there's a common denominator, and it's you. And you may not be the one person that everyone's out to get. And I know some of you feel that way. I just never get a break. I just, and all these people, listen, just, just stop. Because see, relationships start with how we treat others, not how they treat us. And so if you've got a long trail of broken relationships, it might be time to stop and ask, could this be me? What me thing can I fix? And see, I was reading a book this last week on the Titanic And when the Titanic sunk, there were three ships. There were three ships. One was 58 miles away, one was about seven miles away, and one was about 14 miles away. Two of the ships ignored the stress calls, just flat out ignored them. The ship that was furthest away came, and they rescued 700 passengers. One of the ships ignored them, and they saw it. The other ship they never could quite figure out until years and years and years and years later that the reason they did not respond, they were seven miles from the Titanic. The reason they didn't respond to the stress calls of the Titanic is because they were illegally hunting seals in the icebergs. And they thought if they responded, that they would get in trouble. Listen, for some of you in this room, the reason you can't live at peace with other people is because your margin is huge. Your margin's huge. And you're just like that ship. Well, I I can't make this right because you're just as guilty in the relationship as they are. And that's why you're spewing. That's why you're doing it. So it starts with you. It's a you thing. What me thing can I fix? Number two, it's a choice thing. We're capable of having healthy relationships. It's your choice, but it's not by your power. It's by the power of God that we begin to create new pathways. And the way you do that is, is by memorizing God's word and meditating on God's word, muttering on God's word, putting God's word in your heart that you may not sin against him. But lastly, it's a difficult thing because relationships are, me- are messy, but they're worth it. There's something in all of us that were created for relationships. Sadly, in spite of all of this, there's gonna be some that you just can't live at peace with. But when you find that, you need to make sure that you're not the reason why. Amen? If you have someone in your life, maybe you're going to have lunch with them Thursday. And you just can't, I mean, it just, make sure you're not the reason why. Go ahead and gather up some of your coals. They're never going to expect it. Just, Just gather up some of those coals. For some of you, it's going to mean, hey, can I take your plate? Are you done? Just grab some coals. Hey, okay, can I take that trash out for you? Let's just gather up some coals. Hey, I know you don't like me helping the kitchen. Can I, can, I just, can I just gather the dishes up? Just heap those coals. Just come on. Gather them up. And don't just put one in there because that's what we want to do, isn't it? That'll do. <laughs> Heap them. Heap them. Heap them. Just pour them on. Just give it to them. Just give it to them. That's how you live at peace, as far as it depends on you. 
you're responsible for you. You're not responsible for the world, for Facebook, or Twitter, or any other social media platform. Wait, why are you talking? Let it get up here. Take the high road. Take the high road. Because this is the part of your brain that goes, yeah, you could hit them. Yeah, you could run them off the road because we all have those thoughts. Okay, okay, maybe I have those thoughts. Just, just slow down. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. And I thank you that peace is only found in you, that you love us. You have a plan for us. Your word says that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son that if we would believe in him, we would not perish but have everlasting life. But God, our sin separated us from you. You loved us so much because our sin had separated us. And God, you did something about that by sending Jesus. That if we would confess and repent and invite you to be the Lord of our life, that God, you would save us. And God, I know there are many in this room that are saved. There's many who are watching that are saved. But God, I know there could be some that here this morning that they're not at peace with you. There's not a whole lot of peace in their life. Father, would you draw them to you? That God, they would realize you do love them. That Christ died for our sins. That he was raised on the third day. That he is the way, the truth in the life. And God, I pray today that they would surrender their life to you, be reconciled to you through Jesus. And God, I pray for us this week as we go into Thanksgiving, so many of us are going to be around families and there's maybe more than one. God, would you give us the grace to fill the gap this week that we would redo some pathways in our brain and love our enemies, and love those who persecute us, and love on those, and just in view of your mercies of what you did for us, forgive those. Let them off the hook. Cancel the debt. God, give us courage to look like you, smell like you. I love you. Protect everyone who's traveling this week. Give them safety. I look forward to coming back next week, and we ask all this in that beautiful name, Jesus, and everybody said Amen. Love you. Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.